Chapter 4 Prayer and Warfare All prayer ought to be spiritual. Unspiritual prayers are not genuine and can produce no positive result. What abundant spiritual success there would be were every prayer offered by believers on earth in fact spiritual. But sad to say, fleshly prayers are far too numerous. Self-will found therein deprives them of spiritual fruitfulness. Nowadays, Christians appear to treat prayer as a means to accomplish their aims and ideas. If they possessed just a little deeper understanding, they would recognize that prayer is but man uttering to God what is God's will. The flesh, no matter where displayed, must be crucified. It is not permitted even in prayer. No mixing of man's will and God's work is possible, for he rejects the best of human intentions and man's most profitable prospects. God does not will he should follow what man has initiated. Other than following God's direction, we have no right to direct him. We have no ability to offer, save to obey God's guidance. God will do no work which originates with man, no matter how much man may pray. He condemns such praying as fleshly. As believers enter the true realm of the Spirit, immediately they shall see how empty they themselves are, for absolutely nothing in them can impart life to others or work havoc upon the enemy. Instinctively, they will therefore reckon on God. Prayer then becomes imperative. True prayer uncovers the emptiness in the petitioner, but the fullness in the petitioned. Unless the flesh has been reduced to a vacuum by the cross, what use is prayer, and what can it possibly signify? Spiritual prayer does not proceed from the flesh, nor the thought, desire, or decision of the believer. Rather does it follow purely from that which is offered according to the will of God. It is prayed in the Spirit. That is to say, spiritual prayer is made after one has discerned the will of God in his intuition. The command insisted upon in the Bible is to pray at all times in the Spirit. Ephesians 6 verse 18 If that is not the way we are praying, we must be praying in the flesh. We should not open our mouths too hastily upon approaching God. On the contrary, we first must ask God to show us what and how to pray before we make our request known to Him. Have we not consumed a great deal of time in the past asking for what we wanted? Why not now ask for what God wants? Not what we want, but what He wants. If such be the case, then the flesh is provided no footing here. It takes a spiritual man to offer true prayer. All spiritual prayers have their source in God. God makes known to us what we ought to pray by unfolding to us the need and by giving that need as a burden in our intuitive spirit. Only an intuitive burden can constitute our call to prayer. Yet how we have overlooked many delicate registrations in the intuition through carelessness. Our prayer should never exceed the burden in our intuition. Prayers which are not initiated or responded to in the spirit originate instead with the believer himself. They are therefore of the flesh, so that his prayer may not be fleshly, but may be effectual in the spiritual domain. The child of God ought to confess his weakness, that he does not know how to pray, Romans 8 verse 26, and petition the Holy Spirit to teach him. He next should pray according to his instruction. God gives us utterance to pray, just as he gives us utterance to preach. The need for the former equals that of the latter. In acknowledging our total weakness, we then are able to depend on the movement of the Holy Spirit within our spirit for uttering His prayer. How empty that work is, which is done by the flesh! How likewise fruitless is that prayer which is offered in the flesh! Not only should we pray with the Spirit, we should pray with the mind also. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 15 In praying, these two must work together. A believer receives in his spirit what he needs to pray, and understands in his mind what he has received. The spirit accepts the burden of prayer, while the mind formulates that burden in prayerful words. Only in this way is the prayer of a believer perfected. How often the Christian prays according to the thought in his mind without possessing any revelation in his spirit. He becomes the origin of the prayer himself. But true prayer must originate from the throne of God. It initially is sensed in the person's spirit, next is understood by his mind, and finally is uttered through the power of the spirit. Man's spirit and prayer are inseparable. To be
be able to pray with the Spirit, a Christian must learn first to walk according to the Spirit. No one can pray with his Spirit if during the whole day he walks after the flesh. The state of one's prayer life cannot be too greatly disconnected from the condition of his daily walk. The spiritual condition of many too often disqualifies them from praying in the Spirit. The quality of a man's prayer is determined by the state of his living. How could a fleshly person offer spiritual prayer? A spiritual person, on the other hand, does not necessarily pray spiritually either. For unless he is watchful, he also shall fall into the flesh. Nonetheless, should the spiritual man pray often with his spirit, his very praying shall keep his spirit and mind continually in tune with God. Praying exercises the spirit, which in turn is strengthened through such exercising. Negligence in prayer withers the inner man. Nothing can be a substitute for it, not even Christian work. Many are so preoccupied with work that they allow little time for prayer. Hence they cannot cast out demons. Prayer enables us first inwardly to overcome the enemy, and then outwardly to deal with him. All who have fought against the enemy on their knees shall see him routed upon their rising up. Now the spiritual man grows stronger through such exercises, for if a believer prays often with his spirit, his spiritual efficiency shall be increased greatly. He will develop sharp sensitivity in spiritual affairs and will be delivered from all spiritual dullness. The current need of the spiritual Christian is to learn by God's revelation in his spirit how to detect the enemy's attack and subsequently, through prayer, to disclose it. He should quickly understand any movement in his spirit so that he may achieve, immediately through prayer, what God desires him to accomplish. Prayer is work. The experiences of many children of God demonstrate that it accomplishes far more than does any other form of work. It is also warfare, for it is one of the weapons in fighting the enemy. Ephesians 6 verse 18 However, only prayer in the Spirit is genuinely effectual. Praying in the Spirit is most productive in attacking the enemy or resisting his wiles. It can destroy as well as build up. Whatever issues from sin and Satan, it destroys. But whatever belongs to God, it edifies. Prayer is thus one of the most significant instruments in spiritual work and warfare. Yes, spiritual work and warfare turn on the matter of prayer. If a believer fails in prayer, he in fact fails in everything. Spiritual Warfare Broadly speaking, a Christian who has not yet experienced the baptism in the Holy Spirit is rather vague about the reality of the spiritual realm. He is like the servant of Elisha, whose eyes were closed to that sphere. He may receive instructions from the Bible, yet his understanding is confined to the mind because he still lacks revelation in his spirit. But upon experiencing the baptism, his intuition becomes acutely sensitive, and he discovers in his spirit a spiritual world opening before him. By the experience of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, he not only touches the supernatural power of God, but contacts God's person as well. Now it is just there that spiritual warfare begins. This is the period when the power of darkness disguises himself as an angel of light and even attempts to counterfeit the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. It is also the moment when the intuition is made aware of the existence of a spiritual domain, and of the reality of Satan and his evil spirits. The apostles were taught in the scriptures by the Lord after Calvary, but they were made conscious of the real existence of a spiritual realm following Pentecost. Spirit baptism marks the starting point of spiritual warfare. Once a believer has contacted the person of God via the baptism in the Holy Spirit, he then has his own spirit released. He now senses the reality of the things and beings in the spiritual domain. With such knowledge, he encounters Satan. And let us call to mind that the knowledge of a spiritual man does not accrue to him all at once. Some of it may, and usually does, come through many trials. Only those who are spiritual perceive the reality of the spiritual foe and hence engage in battle. Ephesians 6 verse 12. Such warfare is not fought with arms of the flesh. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4. Because the conflict is spiritual, so must the weapons. It is a struggle between the spirit of man and that of the enemy, an engagement of spirit 
with spirit. Before he arrives at such a juncture in his spiritual walk, the child of God neither understands nor can he engage in the battle of the spirits. Only after his inner man has been strengthened by the Holy Spirit does he know how to wrestle with the adversary in his spirit. As he spiritually advances, he begins to discover the reality of Satan and his kingdom, and then it is that he is given to understand how to resist and attack the foe with his spirit. The reasons for such conflict are many, with the enemy's tactic of attack and blocking constituting the greatest. Satan frequently either unsettles the emotions of the physical bodies of spiritual believers, or he blocks the works of the spiritual ones, or he may disturb their environments. The need to fight for God forms still another reason for this warfare. As Satan plots in the air and works on earth against God, so his people fight back with spiritual power, destroying the enemy's plots and plans through their prayers. Though at times saints do not know for sure what Satan's scheme is, nor what he is doing at the moment, they nevertheless continue to press the fight with no let-up, for they understand who their antagonist is. Beyond the above two explanations, spiritual combat has for its existence yet another cause, the need to be delivered from Satan's deception and to deliver deceived souls. In spite of the fact that their spirit's intuition becomes sharp and sensitive after they are baptized in the Holy Spirit, believers may nonetheless fall into deception. To preclude their plunging into the wiles of the adversary, they need not only spiritual sensitivity, but also spiritual knowledge. Should they be ignorant of the manner in which the Holy Spirit leads, they may assume a passive position and thereby become captives of the enemy. The easiest error Christians can commit at this moment is to follow some irrational feeling or experience rather than the leading in their inner man. Once baptized in the Holy Spirit, they have entered the supernatural realm. Unless believers appreciate their own weakness, that is, know how incompetent they are in themselves to encounter the supernatural, they shall be deceived. The Christian spirit can be influenced by either of two forces, the Holy Spirit or the evil spirit. He commits a fatal blunder who thinks his spirit can be controlled solely by the Holy Spirit and not be so by the evil spirit too. Let it be forever known that aside from the spirit that is from God, there is additionally the spirit of the world, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 12, which is in fact the spiritual foe of Ephesians 6 verse 12. Except the Christian shuts up his spirit to resist, he may find the evil one usurping his spirit through deceit and counterfeit. When a child of God becomes spiritual, he is subject to the influence of the supernatural world. At this point, it is vital for him to know the difference between spiritual and supernatural, the confusion of which forms the cause of many deceptions. Spiritual experiences are those which originate with the believer's spirit, while those of the supernatural may not necessarily come from there. They may arise from physical senses or from the solical sphere. A Christian ought never interpret a supernatural experience as always being a spiritual one. He should examine his experiences and determine whether they enter through the outer sensual organs or come via the inner spirit. Whatever emanates from outside, however supernatural it may be, is never spiritual. The Lord's saints should not receive everything supernatural unquestioningly, for Satan too can perform supernatural deeds, no matter how the feeling is during the moment of experience, nor how the phenomenon appears or declares itself to be, believers should investigate its source. The charge of 1 John 4 verse 1 must be strictly observed. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are of God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. The counterfeits of the adversary often exceed the believer's expectation. If the Lord's people will humble themselves by admitting that deception is quite possible to them, they will be the less deceived. Because of the counterfeits of the enemy, spiritual warfare looms inevitable. Unless with their spirits, soldiers of Christ take to the field to meet the foe, they shall find him coming in to suppress their spiritual strength. In spiritual conflict, the spirit of the Christian wars against the enemy evil spirit. Now should the Christian be deceived already, then he fights to regain his freedom. If not, then he strives to rescue others and to prevent the foe from attacking. 
he takes the positive stance of subjugating the enemy by opposing every one of Satan's plans and works. Such battles are fought in the strength of the Spirit. It requires power there to wage war. A Christian must understand how to wrestle against the assailant with his spirit. Otherwise, he cannot detect how the enemy will attack or discern how God will direct him to fight. But if he walks by the Spirit, he learns how to pray incessantly therein against the wicked powers. And with each battle, his inner man waxes that much stronger. He comes to realize that by applying the law of the Spirit, he not only can overcome sin, but also Satan. From that part of the scriptures in which the apostle touches on spiritual warfare, we can readily estimate how important strength is in such conflict. Before he mentions the problem of spiritual warfare, Ephesians 6 verses 11 through 18, Paul first exhorts his readers to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Verse 10, where should there be this strength of which he speaks? Paul tells us in chapter 3, strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Verse 16, the inner man is man's sinner, the spirit of man. And right there is where the powers of darkness attack the man. Now if the inner man is weak, everything else becomes weak. A frail spirit produces fear in the heart, which automatically weakens the believer's stand in the day of evil. What he needs preeminently is a firm spirit. Except he understands the nature of the conflict, a believer is not capable of resisting in his spirit against the principalities and the powers. Many Christians find their spirit feathery and free when all is sweetness and light. But just let there be eruptive war, and their spirit becomes disturbed, fearful, and worried, until finally it is submerged. They do not know why they are defeated. Satan's aim is victory, and to this end he attempts to remove believers from their ascension position by causing their spirit to sink so that he can ascend. Position is a primary factor in battle. When the saint's spirit tumbles, he loses his heavenly position. Christians must consequently maintain a strong spirit and yield no ground to the enemy. Upon realizing how his inner man is strengthened with might through God's Holy Spirit, a spiritual child of God learns the absolute necessity of overcoming the enemy. His inner man grows sturdier as he attacks the foe with prayer and wrestling. In the same manner that the muscles of the wrestler develop in physical combat, just so the strength of the believer's spirit increases as he battles the adversary. The latter mounts an assault in order to depress the believer's inner man and thus to afflict his soul. If the child of God has come to appreciate the wiles of his assailant, he will not surrender at any point, but will instead resist, and his emotional soul is thereby protected. Resistance in the inner man forces the enemy to go on the defensive. Resistance is one of the indispensable elements in spiritual combat. The best defense is a continuous offense, opposed with the will as well as with the strength in the spirit. Giving opposition means struggling free from the power of suppression. The opponent will be routed if one fights his way out by the spirit. But should one allow the enemy to attack and not resist in return, then that one's spirit will surely be depressed, sink very low, and may require many days before it regains its ascendancy. The spirit that does not withstand the enemy is often a suppressed one. How shall we resist? With the word of God, which is the sword of the Holy Spirit. As a believer receives God's word, it becomes spirit and life to him. Hence he can employ this as his weapon of resistance. A heavenly believer knows how to use the word of God advantageously to break down the enemy's lie. Even now a battle is raging in the world of the spirit. Though unobserved by the eyes of the flesh, it is sensed and proven by those who are seeking heavenly progress. Many who are deceived and bound by the enemy need to be released. Not only is there need for release from sin and self-righteousness, many who are bound as well by supernatural experience need release also. Due to curiosity and the prospect of pleasant sensations, Christians gladly welcome these supernatural phenomena, not recognizing that these merely puff up their pride without producing any real or lasting result in terms of a holy and righteous life or spiritual work. When the evil spirits succeed in their deceptions, they gain a footing in the believer. From this ground, the enemy gradually enlarges his frontiers 
until finally he renders the believer as one who walks in the flesh. Now obviously, he who himself is bound cannot possibly set others free. Only when wholly freed, experientially, from the powers of darkness, can the believer himself overcome the foe and rescue others. The incidence of the danger of deception increases in proportion to the number of those who experience the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The need today is for a company of overcoming saints who know how to wage war for the release of those under the enemy's deception. The Church of God shall be defeated if she lacks members who know how to walk by the Spirit and how to fight therewith against the enemy. May God raise up such. Something to guard against in spiritual warfare. Each stage of the believer's walk possesses its particular hazard. The new life within us wages a constant war against all which opposes its growth. During the physical stage, it is a war against sins. In the soulish phase, it is a battle against the natural life. And lastly, on the spiritual level, it is an onslaught against the supernatural enemy. It is solely when a Christian turns spiritual that the evil spirit in that realm launches its assault against his spirit. Accordingly, this is called spiritual warfare. It is fought between spirits and with spirit. Such a phenomenon rarely if ever occurs with unspiritual believers. Do not imagine for a moment, therefore, that when one actually reaches the spiritual plateau, he is beyond conflict. A Christian life is an unending engagement on the battlefield. The Christian has no possibility of laying down his arms until he stands before the Lord. While soulish, he faces conflict with the flesh and its danger. When spiritual, he encounters spiritual warfare and its peculiar hazards. Initially, there is the war against Amalek in the wilderness. Upon entering Canaan, there is next the struggle against the seven tribes of Canaan, wherein the attack of Satan and his evil hosts against the believer's spirit is mounted only after the believer has become spiritual. Since the enemy focuses particular attention on the spirit, how necessary for spiritual believers to keep their own spirit in its normal state and frequently to exercise it as well. They must control with utmost caution all bodily sensations and carefully distinguish all natural and supernatural phenomena. Their mind must be kept perfectly calm without any disturbance. Their physical senses, too, must be maintained in quiet balance without agitation. Spiritual Christians should exercise their will to deny and oppose any falsehood and seek to follow the inner man with their whole heart. Should they at any time follow the soul instead of the inner man, they have lost precious ground already in spiritual warfare. Furthermore, they must be very careful to guard their spirit from being passive in this warfare. Now we have mentioned before that all our guidance must proceed from the inner man. We must wait with our spirit for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. All this is fundamentally true. However, we need to exercise extreme prudence here, lest we fall into grievous error. For while we are waiting in our spirit for the Holy Spirit to move and guide us, a danger readily arises wherein our spirit and our entire being may slide into a state of passivity. Nothing can provide more ground for Satan to work from than this state of inaction. On the one side, we ought not to do anything in our own strength save to obey the Holy Spirit. Yet on the other side, we need to be watchful, lest our spirit or any part of our being turns mechanical and plunges into inertia. Our inner man must vitally govern our total being and must cooperate actively with God's Spirit. When our spirit tumbles into passivity, the Holy Spirit is left with no way to use it. This is because his operation in a human life is absolutely diametrical to that of Satan. The Holy Spirit requires man to cooperate livingly with him. He desires man to work actively with him because he never violates the believer's personality. By contrast, Satan demands a full stop in man so that he may take over and do everything in man's stead. He wishes man to accept his work passively. Satan wants to turn man into an automaton. Oh, how we should guard against whatever is extreme and guard against misunderstanding in spiritual doctrine. We need not fear being radical in obeying the Lord. That is for sure. Nor do we need to guard against being extreme in denying the works of the flesh. But most vigilant must we be that we not be led to any extremes through misconception.
We said most emphatically earlier that we ought to seek God's work, for vain are those things which belong to man and spring from him. We have said that no spiritual value is possible except from what is done by the Holy Spirit through our inner man, and that we should therefore wait with our spirit for revelation from God. Yes, this that we have affirmed is quite true, and blessed is he who is willing to follow this truth. Nonetheless, herein lies one of the gravest perils of all, that of going to the extreme through misunderstanding. Countless believers mistake this truth that we have enunciated as the call to inertia. They conceive the idea that their mind should be emptied for the Holy Spirit to think for them, that their emotion should be suppressed in order for Him to put His affection in them, and that their will should make no decision so that He can decide for them. They mistakenly assume they should accept without question whatever comes to them. Their spirit should not cooperate actively with the Holy Spirit, but should wait passively for His moving. And then, if there be any movement, it automatically is assumed to be from Him. This constitutes a very serious misjudgment. It is a fact that God wants to destroy every work of our flesh, but He never desires to destroy our personality. He takes no pleasure in transforming us into automata. Rather, does He delight in having us cooperate with Him. God does not wish us to be a people void of thoughts, feelings, and decisions. He yearns for us to think what He thinks, feel what He feels, desire what He desires. The Holy Spirit never supplants us in thinking, feeling, and desiring. We ourselves must think, feel, and desire, but all according to God's will. If our mind, emotion, and will plunge into a state of quiescence, in which we are no longer active but idly waiting for an outside force to activate us, then our spirit too cannot escape being passive at the same time. And thus Satan benefits immeasurably when we are unable to exercise our spirit but expect instead to be prodded by some external force. A fundamental difference obtains between the work of the Holy Spirit and that of the evil spirit. The Holy Spirit moves people themselves to work, never setting aside man's personality. The evil spirit demands men to be entirely inactive so that he may work in their place, reducing man's spirit to a robot. Hence a passive spirit not only provides the evil one an opportunity to function, but binds the hand of the Holy Spirit as well, because he will not operate without the cooperation of the believer. Under these circumstances, the evil power inevitably will attempt to exploit the situation. Before a Christian becomes spiritual, he is not confronted by this danger of contacting the satanic power. But once he becomes spiritual, the wicked one naturally will assault his inner man. The fleshly Christian never experiences this passivity of spirit. The spiritual alone encounters the hazard of developing an errant spirit. Due to his misconception of the destruction of the flesh, a child of God may allow his inner man to sink into an inert state. This affords the evil one a chance to simulate the Holy Spirit. If the believer forgets that the enemy may influence his spirit as much as the Holy Spirit can, he unwittingly may accept every moving in his spirit to be from the Holy Spirit and thereby cede ground to Satan for pursuing his aim of destroying the moral, mental, and physical well-being of the saint and making him suffer unspeakable pains. This is exactly what has happened to many who have experienced the baptism in the Holy Spirit. They do not understand that such an experience necessarily initiates them into a closer relationship with the spirit world and exposes them to the influence of both the Holy Spirit and the evil spirit. While they are experiencing a baptism in the spirit, they consider all supernatural experiences to be baptism in the Holy Spirit. Truly, they have been baptized in the Spirit, but the searching question is, in what spirit have they been baptized? In the Holy One or in the Evil One? Both of these may be viewed as baptized in the Spirit. Not recognizing that the Holy Spirit requires their spirit's cooperation and that He never does violence to their personality, many saints allow their inner man to descend into passivity and to permit some outside force to burn, twist, or overthrow them. They, in a word, have been baptized in the evil spirit. Some Christians genuinely have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, yet being unable to distinguish between spirit and soul, they are deceived afterwards. Because of their special experience, 
they maintain that now that the Holy Spirit is in full control, they should not take any active step, but remain completely passive. And so their inner man is submerged in total inertia. Satan begins to feed them many excessive pleasant sensations, and numerous visions, dreams, and supernatural experiences too. They receive them all as from the Holy Spirit, not realizing that their inert spirit, like a magnet, draws in these counterfeit experiences. Had they known how to distinguish the sensational and the supernatural from the spiritual, these believers would have examined those experiences. Now, however, because of a lack of discernment combined with a passive spirit, they settle deeper and deeper into the enemy's deception. As the believer's spirit grows increasingly quiescent, his conscience, of course, follows suit. Once his conscience is rendered passive, he next expects to be led directly by the Holy Spirit, either by voice or by scripture verse. He concludes that he no longer will lead him by his conscience or by decisions emanating from his intuition. Instead, he will be led in the highest way. The Holy Spirit, he now assumes, will speak either directly to him or indirectly through some Bible verses. By ceasing to employ his conscience and by letting it drop into an action, the saint is deceived into minding Satan in his daily walk. The Holy Spirit, however, true to his own working principle, will always refrain from taking over man's conscience and using it for him. Satan alone will seize the occasion to replace the guidance of the believer's conscience and intuition with supernatural voices and other devices. As conscience grows more passive and the evil spirit supplies his guidance, some Christians begin to lower their moral standard, thinking they henceforth live according to a higher life principle, and therefore treat immoral matters as not quite so immoral anymore. They also cease to make any progress in life or work. Instead of exercising their intuitive power to detect the thought of the Holy Spirit or of engaging their conscience to discern right and wrong, they simply follow the supernatural voice which comes from outside and reduce themselves to robots. These Christians mistake the supernatural voice for the voice of God. They disregard their reasoning, their conscience, and other people's advice. They turn out to be the most stubborn individuals in the world. They refuse to listen to anyone. They picture themselves as obeying a higher law of life than the rest of their spiritual confreres. How they fit perfectly in the description of the apostle, whose consciences are seared. 1 Timothy 4 verse 2 Their consciences are void of conviction. Hence to sum up, in our spiritual warfare, we must ever and anon preserve our inner man in an active state, wholly yielded to the Holy Spirit, yet not in passive submission. Otherwise, we shall be deceived by the enemy. Even should the adversary not assault us, we still shall retreat into a shut-in position if our spirit is not operative and outstretched. For the enemy would have the chance anyway to seal off all outlets for our spirit to work, to serve, and to war. It would suffer as though suppressed. Our inner man must accordingly be active and outgoing. It must resist Satan constantly, or else it will be attacked from all sides. Another very important principle to learn in spiritual warfare is that we must attack Satan incessantly. This is to prevent ourselves from being attacked. When a believer has crossed into the domain of the spiritual, he daily ought to maintain a combat attitude in his spirit, praying therewith for the overthrow of all the works of Satan done through the evil powers. If not, he shall discover his spirit shall fall from heaven, grow very weak and feeble, gradually lose its senses, and finally become scarcely detectable. This is all because the believer's inner man has collapsed into such a passive condition that it has ceased to launch out in attack. Hence ground is surrendered to the enemy from which to assail, surround, and shut in his spirit. But if the Christian daily lets out his spirit and continually resists the foe, he will keep his spirit mobilized, and with each passing day it shall wax stronger and stronger. A Christian must be delivered from every misconception with respect to spiritual life. He often surmises, before he enters the spiritual sphere, that if only he could be as spiritual as his brother, how happy he would be. He visualizes his spiritual odyssey as a most happy affair, and so he contemplates spending his days in perfect joy, 
little does he know that the opposite is the truth. The spiritual path does not yield any enjoyment to the person himself. It is instead a life of daily fighting. To remove warfare from a spiritual life is to render it unspiritual. Life in the spirit is a suffering way, filled with watching and laboring, burdened by weariness and trial, punctuated by heartbreak and conflict. It is a life utterly outpoured entirely from the kingdom of God and lived in complete disregard for one's personal happiness. When a Christian is carnal, he lives towards himself and for his own spiritual enjoyment. Of little real value is he in God's hand. Only as he dies to sin and to his personal life shall he be able to be used by God. A spiritual life is one of spiritual usefulness because it is lived to mount assault upon assault against God's spiritual enemy. We ought to be zealous for God, relentlessly attacking that enemy, and never allowing this most useful spirit of ours to sink into passivity.